hey guys hey guys so welcome back to my youtube channel so i discovered a great gap when it comes to bbi case analysis and there is no existing bbi case brief online so i decided to make a video where i'll break down the case brief into two levels at the high court and the next one shall be comprising of the supreme court and then a separate video that will be discussing on what we mean by a basic structure doctrine to its full capacity where we will compile also cases from India like the Keshavananda Bharati case and Minerva Mills that came before the Keshavananda Bharati case. So welcome to this channel. So let us start. So BBI case has been coupled with rumors. Some also have found it very hard to follow the full judgment, the full consolidated Thing, but here I am. So let us start. So the case started at High Court at Nairobi and the parties were David D and others versus the Attorney General and others of 2021 Kenya Law Report. And the brief facts of the case were, I broke down the facts of the case in simple paragraphs that a student will understand. And the first paragraph talks on the task force appointment. Now, the petitioner's case was that on 31st May 2018, the president had appointed a task force on building bridges to unity advisory, whose mandate was to evaluate the national challenges outlined in the joint meeting of building bridges to a new Kenyan nation, and having done so, make practical recommendations and reform proposals that build lasting unity in Kenya. On 26th November 2018, the task force presented its report and the report was titled Building Bridges to a United Kenya from a Nation of Blood Ties to a Nation of Ideals and the report was given to the President. The other paragraph that the student must understand was the contents of the report by the task force. The report consisted of a raft of proposals on constitutional and legislative amendments as well as draft constitution of Kenya Amendment Bill of 2020. Herein, it was referred as Constitutional Amendment Bill. Draft legislative bills was also in co one of the contents in the report. Also, there was administrative measures and other recommendations. It is pleaded that on 25th of November 2020, the president, the former president Uru Kenyatta, had launched the Constitution of Kenya Amendment Bill 2020 and the rollout for collection of signatures had started. When the BIEBC concluded that the, that the bill had received the necessary signatures that month, the signatures were totaling to about 1 million uh, and it had met the threshold to be accepted as the required signatures. Now the matter moved the BBI constitution amendment process to a new stage. Remember that the next stage was supposed to be a referendum. But now, David D. and others challenged that new stage and filed for what we call a conservatory order to prevent the IEBC from preparing for a referendum. Petitioners therefore asserted that unless the application for conservatory orders is heard, Kenyans were, li were at risk at losing billions of money in a process that was in blatant violation of their sovereign power. Accordingly, they also urged that it is the interest of justice that the operations of the respondent and the interested parties be put on hold pending the hearing and determination of these petitions. Before I make the holding of the case down in this analysis, I have discussed what we mean by conservatory orders. So relax, I read you the issues of the case, then we go to the holding, then I tell you the meaning of conservatory orders and the threshold that the orders must be met in order for them to be issued. Issue number one under the level one of the High Court hearing, number one was whether the process being followed to enact the Constitutional Amendment Bill was constitutional in form, in form due to lack of an overall legislation structuring how the process should be undertaken, especially in the county assemblies, where different assemblies may elect one of the possible routes with attendant consequences for uniformity of the legal outcomes. Remember that county assemblies had two routes to take concerning this constitutional amendment. 
And it is important to note that even the holding of the court will still say that county assemblies still have a role to play when it comes to amendments bills concerning the constitution. First route that the county assembly could opt for was the option of introducing the bill by way of notice of motion, which when seconded was to proceed to be debated upon and ultimately a vote could be taken and that option, according to the applicants, was effectively circum circumventing the constitutional requirement and safeguard of public participation in lawmaking, since the public has not been involved in that first process. Now the second option that the county assembly also had was the alternative introduction of the bill as a public bill, which would entail the rigorous of a first reading, committal to committee, public participation, second reading, committal of the bill to the committee again, now of the whole county assembly, debate that reading and ultimately taking a vote as to whether a motion passes or not. That part was discretionary. It was either they go for the first or the second. But the first, as you can see, it was the shortest. And it, the route that the David Lee and other were going to prevent the county assembly from taking. Because public participation is an element in the constitution. Number two, the critical question of the legal competency of the commission based on its composition to carry out a referendum. That was also an issue before the High Court. Number three, the third issue, was the contents of the amendments given a claimed existence of a judicial doctrine of basic structure and eternity clauses, the adequacy of the public participation in the process, and whether Article 47 of the Constitution and fair administrative action were complied with, and the constitutionality of the process through which the Constitutional Amendment Bill was originated. Was the process constitutional? Remember, the main issue is not whether that this bill is unconstitutional or not, they are challenging the process. And you have heard from the third issue, there is a judicial doctrine called basic structure doctrine and eternity clauses. I've told you I'll do a separate video that will take you through the originality of this doctrine. The originality of this doctrine, it is reported it came from America. Who brought this thing? How did the Indian constitution implement this? And how did it come? To the BBI case. That will be a question that will be tackled in a separate video. Stay tuned. Now, before the court, after the petitioners had pleaded for a conservatory order, now a threshold had to be met. The case that outlined this threshold is the Board of Management of Uhuru Secondary School versus City County Director of Education and two others, a 2015 case that said that the following threshold must be met before a conservatory order is issued by the court. Now, number one, the applicant ought to demonstrate an arguable prima facie case with a likelihood of success. In other words, it has to show that a case which discloses arguable issues has been raised, and in this case, arguable constitutional issues. It does not mean that you should be likely to be one giving you it does not mean that you'll be the one directly being given a winning verdict but rather a constitutional issue is prima facie um, a threshold that will expose arguable issues in the matter and therefore it will be allowed number two threshold once the applicant had established to the court satisfaction a prima facie case with a likelihood of success the court was then to decide whether a grant or renewal of the conservatory relief will enhance the constitutional values and objects of the specific right or freedom of the Bill of Rights. Thirdly, flowing, flowing from the first two principles is whether if an interim conservatory order is not granted, the petition or its substratum will be rendered nugatory. It is indeed the business of the court to ensure and secure as far as possible that any transitional motions before the court do not render nugatory the ultimate end of justice. And number four, the court must consider conservatory orders also in the face of public interest dogma. And finally, the court is to exercise its discretion in deciding whether to grant or deny a conservatory order. The court must 
consequently consider all relevant credentials. The prima facie correctness of the available information, whether grievances are genuine, legitimate and deserving, and finally, whether the grievances and allegations are grave and serious or merely vague and reckless. After considering all those thresholds, what will the court say in this matter? The High Court threw a span in the works by issuing a conservatory order. Consequently, this is what the court said. We hereby order that a conservatory order B and his is hereby issued restraining the IEBC from facilitating and subjecting the Constitutional Amendment Bill of 2020 to a referendum or taking any further action to advance the Constitutional Amendment Bill of 2022. Pen 2020, pending the hearing and determination of these consolidated petitions, the court issued a conservatory order to maintain the status quo, to maintain that no referendum should happen before the matter has been determined. This was done in order to achieve what we call saving the Wanjiku. Understanding now conservatory orders. Conservatory orders are be, have been listed as one of the orders that can be granted by the court under section Article 27 of the Constitution. Now, what do you mean by conservatory orders? This is a question where most people ignore. Conservatory orders, like the one issued on BBI, are powerful remedies that are often misunderstood. That is especially true where as here the political stakes are high and the issues controversial. Unpacking what a conservatory order is and what it can be applied may help explain the court's decision to put the IBC referendum on ice. A conservatory order, as its most basic, is a decision by a court to ensure things do not change while a case is being decided. It preserves the status quo. It maintains the way things are at the moment. Conservatory orders are usually requested at the beginning of a case, but as here in this BBI case, they can be requested after the, the litigation has started if there is a significant change in the circumstances. Remember the following and note it clearly. A conservatory order is not a prohibition. That will also be tackled where I will be discussing the orders that the court can grant one by one. It is important you know which orders we want the court to grant to you. Now, the party applying for a conservatory order must testify three requirements. Firstly, the applicant must show that the case has merit, as I discussed above. You cannot be petitioning the court in order to waste its time in a case that is not meritable. And the second requirement lies at the heart of why a conservatory order may be necessary. An applicant must show there is real and imminent danger that the applicant's legal rights or claims will be irreparably damaged and if a conservatory order is not issued, it will pre be prejudicial to the matter at hand. A real danger is one that is not theoretically but is present and happening. An imminent danger is one that must be dealt with immediately. It is not an issue that is on the horizon or that can be put off, but one that must be addressed now. Remember that at that time the country was going for a general election, at the same time the BBI process, if it was allowed to continue to a referendum, that would mean the country was in an imminent danger of misusing public finances. But before slamming on the brakes concerning referendum, the court must consider a that issue, and that issue is the most important one. Whether a conservatory order is in the public interest and whether it's supported by the Constitution. To be in the public interest, the court had to determine whether its decision was just, equitable, and efficient. A conservatory order must also be consistent with the values and principles of the Constitution and not inappropriately infringe on the rights and freedoms in the Bill of Rights. Why did the High Court issue this order? That is a question that will be answered in the next few seconds. These requirements help us better understand why the court issued the conservatory order. When the IBC certified the signatures, it significantly changed the status of the case. It started a 90-day period during which all the county assemblies had to 
approve or reject the proposed amendments. And that is why you are hearing scandals that a certain county assembly have approved and the next one has rejected. Why? Was money changing hands? That is a question. I'm not in a possibility, in a position to answer. The process by which the counties consider the amendments is one of the issues before the High Court in this matter. Those applying for conservatory order worried that the claims will no longer be relevant if the counties were to make the decision before the court had a chance to rule on the matter. The applicants also worried that if the process were to continue and then later be held unconstitutional, it will cost Kenyan citizens millions of shillings that could not be recouped. Therefore, the court considered these concerns in light of the requirements. First, it concluded that the claims challenging the amendment and referendum process were not frivolous. While not a high bar, it established that whatever the motions of the parties and their claims were real and have not been merely to delay the BBI process. The court then turned to the next question whether real and imminent harm would occur if a conservatory order is not granted. The court did not agree that the concerns raised about the county assembly's approval process would be meaningless unless the case was halted, because the court assemblies had yet to consider the amendments that fear was not yet imminent, because the county assembly had not yet considered the amendments, therefore the danger that the petitioner was claiming for was not imminent. Yet, even if enough county assemblies did approve the bill, the court still had the power to determine whether they did so in a constitutional way. In the end, it was the court to make the final say. Now, the court was also not terribly concerned that allowing the counties to consider the amendments would waste money. It concluded that the cost of considering the amendments was not so high as to justify halting the whole process because the High Court has the authority to hold the approval process unconstitutional. Even after that process had completed, it did not need to put on the brakes now. And finally, the court addressed a major and final issue. What cost was to be enforced, incurred by the IEBC in preparing for a referendum? That was the imminent danger that the petitioner had brought before the court. The High Court found that the dangers here were real and imminent. Conducting a referendum would cost billions of shillings and if the amendment process were found to be unconstitutional, those costs would never be recovered. As the court explained, allowing the IEBC to proceed may mean that the country's scarce financial resources would have been unnecessary. Expanded. That is the whole process that took place in the High Court at Nairobi. I've told you I'll break this video in two levels. One is the High Court at Nairobi and the one will be at the Supreme Court. And the final one will be what do you mean by basic structure doctrine, the origin of the doctrine and why the doctrine was not applicable in Kenya.